Should I invest in a global index, buying thousands of companies from all over the world, or just buy the S&P 500, the largest 500 or so companies in America? Warren Buffett himself thinks the S&P 500 is almost investors need. An S&P 500 low cost index fund. And for a long time now, He's been spot on. American dominance. The most powerful country in human history. While the rest of the world, well... Flat as a pancake, huh? Sometimes I look at this and think, what the hell am I doing investing in a global index? Seriously, it's like here's the winning team, world champions, never lost a game, complete dominance, and I'm just betting on the reserves. Is it time to concede and go all in on the winner? The United States. You Working together to produce an ever greater abundance. New closing high. American people in their righteous might. What makes a country outperform? More specifically, what's made America outperform? Its size, resources, a lack of threats on its borders. You're not that guy. Maybe it's its military might. All the guns. Lots of guns. 37% of global military spending. Its successful mobilization of human capital, easy access to free flow and financial capital, combine that all with an entrepreneurial culture fostered in its political capital. That great American dream. Whatever it is, the Americans did it, and they did it pretty well. But will that always be the case? The times ahead will be radically different from those that we've experienced in our lifetimes, though similar to many times before. I was Ray Dalio, billionaire founder of the world's largest hedge fund and a keen bow and arrow hunter. I mean, I told you America had all sorts of weapons. Ray has strong views on the changing of the world order and the likelihood of America slipping down the global pecking order. I don't want to get too deep into that today, but I think his core point is relevant to our discussion in that over a long enough time horizon, all things change, but also that those changes echo the past. Let's look at changes first. Changes, changes, more changes. This chart's taken from a wonderfully overpriced book called The Triumph of Optimists, 101 Years of Global Investment Returns. It shows how over the 120-ish years that mark the rise in American markets, how the influence of countries has changed. The UK here, as an example, was 25% of the global stock market. It's now around 4% and the UK political system seems committed to getting that to zero as quickly as possible. But it just shows the decline in British influence over that period this chart really tells so many interesting stories. How about Japan's rise here? It's sort of telling that this period looks like a bubble in the fabric of the diagram. Because the rise of Japan is still one of the biggest economic bubbles of all time. At its height, land in Tokyo commanded such a premium that the 1.15 square kilometers that made up the Imperial Palace was said to be worth more than all of the land in the state of California. I mean, we can see how things went from there. Those who witnessed Japan's rise may have thought it would last forever, but things change. And yes, it is true that America has grown to be a global superpower. If we look at the start and end of the measured time period on a pie chart, we can see how dramatic that rise is. But what this graph demonstrates so well is the fluctuations we've seen across that period in the total influence on global markets that America has had. And that brings us on to the next bit. Though similar to many times before. So recency bias is the tendency to favor recent events over historic ones. For all my Europeans out there, the Brew in 2005 noted that acts that performed last in the Eurovision tended to get higher marks, just simply because people could remember the performances more clearly. Recency bias also leads to people thinking what has happened recently will continue to happen. So it's likely that after a decade of outperformance from American markets, many would expect that to continue. This table shows us the performance of the US stock market versus the rest of the world. The orange bars are when the rest of the world outperformed the USA, and the yellow are when the USA outperformed. Since 2008, we can see the USA's dominance here. But historically speaking, this stretch of American art performance like we've seen here is actually quite unusual. It's often quoted, no it's not, I'm just saying that, but it is true that over the last 50 years, American markets have produced a 1% per year annual return above that of international markets. 50 years of outperformance. So why bet on the other team? Well, whilst that stat is flattering, it fails to discuss the fact that all of that outperformance has occurred in the last eight years. Up to 2014, the performance of US and international markets was pretty much level. Then America hit the gas. Studying 50 years of performance like this is a bit misleading though, because investors don't just invest at the start and then never invest again. They dollar cost average into the market every month, which smooths out the performance differences. But this notion of American dominance always and forever is just not accurate. We can see that the performance moves in cycles, moving from US to international outperformance. So are we about to enter a period of international overperformance? Well, 2023 certainly doesn't think so. You could see a new all-time high on the S&P 500. But maybe this rapid rise in US equities this year, especially anything linked to AI, points to a problem. 
the US market by historical measures is overvalued by around 50% according to Schiller's CAPE or cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. This could point to a period of relative underperformance to come as the market reverts back down to this mean. But also bear in mind that markets can stay over or undervalued for long periods of time. Like here in the 70s and 80s where markets were very undervalued or here where the US market was overvalued by as much as 80% for a significant amount of time. This is no indication of a crash to come, more a nod to how expensive the US market is versus the relative value of the rest of the world. At the moment, the rest of the world looks like a better deal than the American markets. But I do think there's a lot of merit also in the argument that America will just keep on keeping on. First up, let's just go back to what Ray said. I said it wouldn't get all change in world order, didn't I? But here we are. So to summarise Ray's main point into one line, it's that all great powers fade over time and that would include America. In his book, Change in World Order, Ray plots the relative standings of great empires over time. Here is the UK's decline that we also saw on the chart a minute ago. Two other things to point out here, look at China coming up real quick, and that America appears to have peaked in around the 60s and, and is now in decline. But hold on, their relative influence may have fallen versus other empires, but they still have produced exceptional returns since Ray said that their empire started to decline. American dominance. Every single person watching this will likely see America continue to be a world superpower and deliver solid returns for investors well past the point it matters. And maybe as the world becomes more linked through globalization, America might even buck this declining trend. There is an argument that if you buy the American markets, you're buying the world market anyway. Such is the size and influence of the American markets. I can fully subscribe to the narrative that as emerging markets like India grow and people become wealthier in those countries, companies like Apple and Alphabet will benefit selling services into those markets. But if we rule out all other players, then surely we're doing the world a bit of an injustice. I mean, look at the success of ByteDance's TikTok, or the fact that the world's richest man until recently was a majority shareholder of luxury fashion empire LVMH, a French business that's delivered exceptional returns for investors. So what is the answer? I see many people at this point go, okay, well, I'll just buy both. 50-50 S&P 500 Global Index. I just want to point out that a 50-50 portfolio like this is actually heavily weighted towards USA. It's around 80% USA. So by buying both, you're actually buying more of one. Remember, when you buy a global index, you're still putting around 65% of all your money into America anyway. When I buy a global index, I am betting on America. I'm just placing smaller bets on other parts of the world as well. I honestly think both approaches will do well if an investor is consistent and invests long term. My decision to buy a global index actually really isn't about which will provide the best returns. It's more about me. I'll get onto that in a second. But first, I want to look at the funds that I'm buying right now with you. Please understand, though, that I'm not a financial advisor. This isn't financial advice. I just wish to share with you what I buy. And please note that I regularly switch funds depending on which investing platform I'm using at the time. For me, though, it's just about achieving global exposure as low cost as possible. I currently get this in the main through VWRL. You can also get VWRP if you want the dividends to be auto reinvested for you. I just like to do that myself. And then in my SIP, I have the FTSE Global All Cap. The difference here is it has exposure to smaller businesses as well. All cap or all capitalizations means all sizes. I leave an up to date list of all the brokers that I'm using in the description of every video. I've always been a bit of a Vanguard fanboy, hence the use of their funds. But I might actually mix this up a bit in the near future. As I do note that I could use a combination of iShare funds or another provider and probably reduce the cost. Or Vanguard could just reduce the fees on their global products. That'd be nice. Actually, talking about fees, that's one area where the American-only approach is a clear winner. The fee on Vanguard's VUSA index is only 0.07%, whereas VWRL, their world fund, is 0.22% meaning the fees are three times higher. I've just used a compound interest calculator to work this out and I'll link it below. I used an investment of 1K a month for 30 years. The more you invest, the more fees you pay. So I wanted to put a higher amount to show the impact. I could have just put 100 quid a month to make the difference not look that big, but I think it's more useful to use large amounts. I assume a growth rate of 8% over 30 years. I ignore any platform fees. There is around a 45,000 pound difference in the fee in the example between a pure American approach and the global approach. That's significant. You're paying higher fees because certain markets and places are more expensive to trade. I also think these companies know that they can make a bit more money on a global approach, so they charge you more for it. For me personally though, the benefit of global exposure and access to all of the markets is worth that trade-off in fees because all chat of performance and world order and bow and arrows or whatever else, none of that really matters. The reason I pick a global index can be summarized like this. I am an idiot. My own worst enemy. I have a tendency to take risks when I shouldn't. I overthink things for no good reason. 
My rational brain knows that a consistent long-term approach to investing will likely produce the best returns, but my monkey brain wants to chase anything shiny that moves past my eyes. If I'm all in S&P 500 and in 10 years time America has underperformed and we see this trend of international outperformance come back again, am I going to sit there like, hmm, should I change things around and fiddle with it? Maybe. A global approach removes that decision. I don't have to think about what market is doing what or the impact of foreign exchange on my returns. I'm just simply betting that the world will keep turning and that the global economy long term will continue to grow as it always has done. I highly suspect though that in 30 years I'll look back and go, yeah, Damo, should have slapped it on the S&P, mate. <laughs> but I'm okay with that because the long term nominal average return of 8.3% global markets have produced is more than enough for me to hit my financial goal. I carve off a percentage of what I invest each month for more speculative bets. Crypto, individual stocks, whatever, it's just a bit of fun. Keeps my idiot brain busy and stops me messing with the 90% that will likely actually change my life. And really, instead of stressing over where I should put my money and worrying if I might miss out on a percentage point here or there by not focusing at all on America, I focus on increasing my contributions into my investments through improving my income, as I have far more control over that than I do over the changing of the world order.